Did you know that in 2020 that the third leading cause of death amongst African-American males in between the ages of 15 and 24 was suicide? As a matter of fact, African-American males are four times as much to commit suicide than African-American females. And some of the reasons for this is due to sadness, hopelessness, feelings of worthlessness, and that life is just too much of a struggle. Now, if you look further down the age demographic of African-American males, the suicide rate decreases. In between 25 and 44, it's 19.5% slightly increases. In between the ages of 45 and 64, which is my age group, is 11.6, and 65 and over is 8.9. Now, like I said, it decreases if these young men make it that far. I have a video of Corey Hardick. He was on this podcast, been interviewed, and the subject of his divorce came up and he really poured out his heart. And I wanna watch it with you and I'm gonna give my commentary on it and share my story when I was in a low place. So without further ado, let's get into this. On a recent panel, you said you couldn't sleep for a year and a half or something and mm -hmm. that you cried for a lot of that time. How difficult was that period mm -hmm. in life for you? Because we know as men and as black men, we're starting to get into a space where we talk about not only mental health, but emotional health. Right. And we've learned ways to be vulnerable and open. Mm -hmm. But to share that in a room full of people, I mean, that's something that you felt deeply. Mm -hmm. How did you find a way to get through that time while also having to still be a father, a provider, right. and do your job. You know, I, I feel like you'll never get through that. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of praying, a lot of knowing that God is real. God is actually truly real in my life. A lot of stillness, man. When you sit still a lot, you know, you can hear a lot of things for me. A lot of isolation, solitude, and um, just, knowing, you know, if I can just put one foot in front of the other, you know, and take it a day at a time, because I'm, I'm taking it a day at a time, still to this day. Really? Oh. Yeah, I just take it a day at a time. You know, black men have feelings. You know, black men hurt. Black men are in, like, pain, and sometimes we don't have outlets to, you know, like, talking to you now, no one really asked me these questions, never, really. So it's like sometimes we feel like we're dealing with it alone, not unless you have like a therapist or, a, you know, a close confidant or like friend. But um, it's, it's not easy because it feels like as a black man, you can't show vulnerability to the world, you know, because it's a form of weakness. But it should be looked at as a form of strength, you know, like men do need to cry, you know, because when it's all bottled up, you know, and, and inside, you know, that's when stress, things can happen, different tensions. You gotta be able to have a, a outlet to release. Like I said, that's the only way that you can get to the true healing of everything. So, um, yeah, I, when I was speaking in Miami, that's just how I was felt, how I felt at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, so to this day, I just, I look at my kids and say, daddy got you forever. You know, I look at my daughter. You know, when they smile at me and they know daddy really loves them, my son knows daddy really loves me. That's what brings me joy right now. And that's what keeps me saying, I'm, I'm on my way. I wanna be the biggest in the world, you know? From a humble place, but I feel like from a skill set, I feel like I am that dude. Like that's just how I really feel. And I feel like I can step into that more because of my children, because of my mom and having the promise I gave her and I'm, I'm ready to do all those things. Whew. Man, let me, let me grab my composure because when I look into that brother's eyes, I see the hurt in his eyes. He's still hurting, but he's fighting on. He loved his wife and he still loved that woman. He didn't want that. He didn't want it. And I'm not here to beat up on Tia. I pray that she has a change of heart. And to be quite honest, I think the best option is for them to reconcile. But I know that right now where her head is at, she, she's not thinking like that. And it's really sad to see a brother go through this, you know, because as he stated that 
in all the interviews he has had, no one really has asked him those type of questions. And for him to lay it all out on the line like that, you know, showed a lot of vulnerability and trust. I believe that in his message as a man, as a black man, we could take from that is that we need to be able to have an outlet to talk to each other about these things. I really like the way he said that God has become real, more real to him. I can imagine that he's doing a lot of praying, not just for his family, for the safety of his family, and not just for himself and his sanity, but I believe he's also praying for his ex-wife so that she can come to her senses, you know? And I know that some guys may not look favorably upon doing that, but being married almost two decades, or maybe they were two decades, I can't remember, you just can't switch that off. That he finds time to meditate and just be still, just to hear from God, just to hear from God so that he can make the right steps, so that he can have the correct behavior and the right attitude. Man, man. He mentioned something important about when black men express their feelings or the fear of expressing them can be seen as weakness. Now, I don't know if that's something that was instilled in us because I kind of felt that way growing up as a young man. Now, I didn't grow up with my biological father. I had a stepfather. And I remember the one time that I tried to cozy up to him to get guidance as a young man. I called him daddy. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. And he told me, I'm not your daddy. Your daddy lives in Houston. And I don't think he was trying to be mean, but I think I was around nine years old, but the way it came across, I felt abandoned. And I don't know what it was I wanted to talk to him about, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to talk to him, right? But from that point on, I never really talked to him about anything deep. I never really got deep with anyone about anything. And when I see Corey, how he answers the questions about his ex-wife, I've, I've never heard him belittle her or put her down, and I um, compliment him for that because he still has a level of respect for his wife because that's the mother of his children. And I know that he still deeply loves her. I know there's some guys that would say, man, just let her go. She's for the streets. But how can you say that after you've been married for almost two decades? I don't know if they were married quite 20 years or pulling up close on it, but I know they were pretty close. They were heavily invested in years in their marriage. And he, he could have taken a low road and really latched on to the red pill and MGTOW, but he didn't. If my wife would have left me after 15 years of marriage, I would be heartbroken too. I don't know of any man that wouldn't be heartbroken. And of any man, especially if you remember the good times you've been through, the bad times, how you guys... Uh, triumph through difficult times, your wins, your losses, all the things, the family gathering, the fun, the romantic times. You can't just throw that all away. You can't turn it off like a switch, you know. And um, for him to open up like that took a lot of courage. And unfortunately, there's a lot of men that they just don't do that. They feel like they can't be vulnerable like he he was. And I believe that podcast have millions of followers. So to do that on uh, social media for the world to see, you know, millions to see, you know, it takes a lot of courage and it says a lot about him as a man. I really admire him for that. See, I was married before and my ex-wife, she couldn't stay faithful. Now imagine coming home from work and you walk into your place and you see your wife in the bed with another man, knocked out sleep, right? And uh, I tried to forgive her several times, and we weren't even married for two years, but that was agonizing, man. That divorce was agonizing for me. I felt like a failure. You know, I knew my mom and my biological father got a divorce. I said, when I get married, I don't want to get a divorce. 
But that happened, and it happened. You know, it just happened. When I married my my second wife, we've been married for 28 years, I had a lot of triggers, you know, going on within me. You know, I fought in the first Gulf War. I experienced something over there I never got help for. And when my wife now and I, we were going through hard times, I got into a space where I thought that they would be better off without me. I didn't have anyone to talk to about what I was going through, right? Nobody. At least I felt that way. My best friend at the time who was alive, he really didn't get along with my my current wife, so he really didn't have a lot of helpful advice to offer. And I said to myself, well, you know, if I off myself, then maybe they can get public assistance, right? The look on my wife's face when she was holding me, I was on the floor in the restroom because I tried to um, poison myself and my stomach getting pumped. They had to call for that. And thank God no permanent damage happened, but the fear in her eyes, the fear of being left alone, right? And uh, I can remember going in and out. I didn't, I didn't really want to die. But at the same time, I was just tired, man. I was just tired, just tired. But thank God, you know, he had other plans for me, you know. It took my wife some time to trust me after that. But I say that for you brothers, you know, really get around a group of men that, that can really support you constructively, right, to help you through issues. And I would say to other men, don't ridicule other men if they're, they're having trouble getting through things because we need each other. And I would say to the ladies, look, especially to our black women, look, we black men, we have feelings, man, we do. We don't always get everything right. We don't always say the right things. A lot of us have made some crazy mistakes and, and choices, but we need our black women to get behind us, right? We're not asking you to cuddle us like little babies, like we're little boys, but especially those that are married to us, our wives, maybe our fiancés, our girlfriends, our sisters. Instead of grouping all black men in the, under this one umbrella, maybe because some of y'all have had a bad run-in with a misbehaving male, you know, don't group us all together like that because... You know, we need the support of our ladies. We need, we need that support because when we're going through hard times, we need somebody that we could trust to talk to. And it's very important to understand that, yes, we know that women have feelings. And as a man, I know that I have to be attentive, especially to my wife's feelings. But I say this, this to the ladies, look, we have feelings too. When we get rejected, when we don't meet a certain goal, maybe if we lose a client or maybe we don't, you know, life isn't where we thought it should be, you know, after working hard. And uh, sometimes it could just take a toll on us. But my hat's off to Corey Hardick, man. And I pray, I really pray. I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I pray the reconciliation of his marriage. You know, if there's still hope there. You know, I know some of the brothers are going to say, man, she's for the streets and this, that, and the other. But like I said, you can't turn that off, man. You know, 14 plus years, been in a marriage, you know, it's hard. You know, women think that men don't feel deeply. We do. We're just very logical and we're not vocal about it. But we feel deep. We hurt deep. As you saw in those stats, that third leading cause of death by African-American males in between the age of 15 and 24 is often themselves. It gets up slightly higher, 25 through 44, and starts to dip a little bit when it gets towards my age. But still, any life, any 1% is too much. So I just say, look, sisters, don't be so hard on the brothers. And brothers, 
Don't be so prideful to not open up to one another and go get some help. Seek counseling. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with getting professional help. Thank God I got the professional help to deal with those things, especially when a life seems so overwhelming, right? And we can't wait until life gets so overwhelming for us to try to reach out because sometimes it could almost be too late and you don't want it to get to that point. So anyhow, I'm going to get on out of here. And if you liked what I said, give me a thumbs up so that those that really need to hear this message can hear it, share it with the brothers so that they can know that it's okay to get help. It's okay to talk about your issues. It's okay to be vulnerable. It doesn't mean that you're a wimp. It means that you're strong enough to reach out to somebody. And subscribe to my channel if you're really feeling what I'm saying. And feel free to watch any of those videos that's up in those corners. And until the next time, I will see you on the next one. Peace.